weird thing. I'm curious. Do you think capitalism is dying? There's a lot of um, billionaires out there that's saying the inequality gap is very large, such as Ray Dalio and Warren Buffett. And then if uh, we have a democratic president and all the houses are democratic, um, do, do you think capitalism will die down in America? What is your opinion on that? So that's a great question. I, uh, I think that there's some legitimate arguments against the existing status quo, uh, which are because we're not really in a capitalist economy, we're in a crony capitalist economy in which we've created structural inequalities um, for a variety of reasons that are related to what I would identify as special privileges that have been granted to some at the expense of others. And I don't believe that that's necessarily endemic to capitalism if we, if we had the right rules. So go back to my four pillars again, right? One of them is hope. And institutional problems demand institutional solutions. And so we have an institutional problem that's being identified. What the problem is, is not billionaires, right? So that's where I would disagree. So I just recently read Bigger Than Bernie, which yeah. is a book about the Bernie Sanders movement and everything. And I have a lot of sympathies with aspects of what the people there want to get in terms of uh, injustice that needs to be corrected, uh, wars that don't need to be fought, you know, all these kind of things like that. I share their passion and compassion for the least advantage or like that. I just think they have the wrong means to obtain yeah. that end. They think the answer is to empower the state because they think that the state will then be utilized, the workers will be the ones who are in control of the state. The reality is the state officials are the ones who are in control of the state. And the state officials are going to rearrange the system to benefit themselves at the expense of others. And so as a result, you perpetuate. So to me, the kind of policies that a Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and AOC uh, would promote would actually exacerbate the problems they're trying to solve rather than solve the problems. On the same time, you know, the Mitch McConnells of the world and all these other ones, they're not a solution either. I mean, you know, so uh, it's not like I see any salvation on either one of these fronts because I think our current conversation is totally messed up. And that I, so I think there's, there's three serious economic policy questions in the United States. The first one is the fiscal gap the amount of obligations that the government has taken on that it has to meet in 25, 30, 40 years from now, and the ability 25, 30, 40 years from now to pay to, the, to that, given the realities of the demographics and everything else, that gap is growing and growing and growing, which is very, very damaging to the long-term health of the US economy. The second one is the extraordinary measures that the Fed has taken on during the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, and then now has led to a situation where the Fed is supposed to basically just keep printing money to solve all our problems. And we need to figure out an end game strategy to that. And how do you unwind that? And we're not having that conversation. Mm -hmm. And then the third one is the structural inequalities, which I argue is because we've increased such restrictions in the labor market. We've made labor markets more, less fluid than they used to be. And as a result, people get sidetracked in their ability to move up the quintiles. So it's not that if you look at the United States and you look at a Gini coefficient, that is the measure between you know, the, 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 the uh, richest and, uh, and inequality. It appears that we're this really unequal society. But if you look at mobility between the quintiles, historically, the United States was the most equal. So someone who's in the bottom quintile can rise to the top. Someone who's in the top can go to the bottom. And what's been captured in the work by people like Raj Chetty and others is that that mobility has slowed. And then the question that I think you have to ask is why did the mobility slow? 
And I think it's because of we've gummed up our labor markets. We've caused all kinds of restrictions and whatnot in labor markets. In, in fact, that, that has slowed down that growth. So there's real reasons for the death and despair that we need to think about. But the question is, is I don't think that's because there's some billionaires, right? Jay-Z and Beyonce are billionaires. They're not the reason why we're, we're frustrated in the world, right? Uh, and I think that's also true for people that are, you know, big finance people that act on, you know, speed trading or whatever and make a boatload of money. They're not the reason why we're frustrated. Let me just say one last thing about this which is kind of a weird example. But if you go online and you look up these experiments with the Kapuchkin monkeys, it, it's a very interesting thing. So they have uh, these two monkeys, at time, Kapuchkin monkeys. It turns out Kapuchkin monkeys will strictly prefer sweets to just uh, plain like fruit or vegetables, but they can survive on just the regular vegetables. So they have in front of them, the distributor has in front of her, cucumbers and grapes, okay? And the, the monkey has to do a task. And the reward for the task is gonna be one of these things. So the first monkey goes and does the task and gets given a cucumber. The monkey eats the cucumber and is quite happy. You know, they're, they're, they're eating a cucumber, it's fine. The second monkey does the task but when that monkey finishes the task, the distributor gives it a grape. Now this monkey, the first monkey is looking over and sees <laughs> there's a grape and they know the difference between grapes and cucumbers. And so sees that and then this monkey eats a grape, is very happy. So then turns to this monkey and says, do the task again. And the monkey goes to do the task, it puts its hand out waiting, you know, now it thinks it's gonna get a grape, instead <laughs> gets a cucumber again takes a bite of it then throws it back at the, at the, at the, the mm. experimenter. Yeah. Then, you know, does the second monkey, gives it the, the grape again. All right, this monkey's happy. This monkey's really pissed. Does the task again. Now really is expecting, you know, to get the thing, gets the cucumber again, doesn't even taste it this time, just takes its hand out and hits the thing like that. The second monkey goes, gives a grape again. And now it gets interesting because the monkey now is outraged. But who is the monkey outraged against? The monkey shakes the cage at the distributor, not at the other monkey. So it's wrong to think that we suffer from envy, right? Which is if the monkey was envious, the anger would be directed at monkey two, not at the distributor. Instead, the monkey is upset with unfairness and therefore is shaking the cage at the person responsible for the unfairness. I think we're misidentifying when we say, oh, look at these billionaires, because we think it's the other monkey that has it. Where really what we're worried about is we think that that other monkey has those billions because this distributor, let's call it the government, is doling out favors to their friends. And it turns out, Sometimes that's right, yeah. <laughs> right? They're, they're gambling with other people's money. So you look at the big banks after 2009, right? And they got bailed out. You know, it's, I don't know if I use this joke when you were in, in class, but I, I sometimes try to teach moral hazard. I say to the students, I say, hey, you know, I'm going to take you to Vegas this weekend. And, you know, I pick one of the students out. I said, we're going to go to Vegas and I'll cover all your losses, but you get to keep all your profits. I said, how are you going to, how are you going to bet? Are you going to bet on the slot machines? Or are you going to be at the roulette wheel? It was like, oh, I'm at the roulette wheel and I'm betting. I said, oh yeah, I didn't realize your name was Goldman Sachs. You know, <laughs> nice to meet you, Goldman, you know, like that. <laughs> it's not that Goldman Sachs got crazy. It was that Goldman Sachs did exactly what they were was rational for them to do, given what the expectations of the game were. But who created those expectations? The government, the central distributor in this case. Yeah. And so it, it, if we think that it's because rich people are rich, that poor people are poor, what we have to worry about is not that they're rich, but who was unfair in the way that they dealt it out. So we tend not to be upset about 
LeBron becoming a billionaire or, or Michael Jordan becoming a billionaire or Beyonce or, or you know, anyone like that. But we tend to, those, those um, you know, not even Bill Gates, because we see that Bill Gates created all this software that we have, or not Steve Jobs or whoever, you know, because we see that we use an iPhone and we love it, you know, and things that we don't know. But we tend to think that people that do things that we just take for granted, having lots of money is somehow bad. Let me tell you one other story of this. When I was a kid, when I got out of, out of college, I started working as a tennis pro. I, I was teaching a tennis area, which is a very wealthy area of New Jersey. And uh, the people there that had these giant mansions were, uh, they weren't orthodox, but they were conservative Jewish people from Sheep's Head Bay and Long Island, who in the summer vacationed here. <clears throat> so they followed the Sabbath. But unlike Orthodox, they, they had a huge party before sundown. <laughs> so they would start on, you know, having these huge parties on, sa on Friday nights. So one of the things that they did, they all had these mansions and they all had tennis courts in them. And they would rotate in the community between them this is late 70s, early 80s. So tennis is really popular at the time. And they would hire all the tennis pros from the area to come and play doubles matches, right? The tennis pros would play doubles matches and they would bet on them. And some of them would join in and be part of a team, the better players or whatever, but that's what they did. So we would rotate between these houses. So I'm an economics guy, even though I'm a tennis pro, right? I study economics. Yeah. And I'm also looking at these houses and these houses are like bigger than anything I've ever seen. So I'm kind of curious, like how the hell do you have all this? You know, I'm materialistic enough. I want a Mercedes and I'd like to have a big house like this. So every single one of them, it was shocking to me because I thought they would tell me that they invented some exotic thing. So the very first guy that I meet, he says the following thing to me. I go to him, I said, so how'd you get all this like this? And he says, um, he goes, your mother ever tell you don't get your panties in a bunch? And I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> he goes, yeah, no one wants their panties in a bunch. He says, I sell the elastic on people's underwear. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, what do you mean? He goes, yeah. He goes, I sell the elastic. I'm a wholesaler. I sell the elastic that goes into people's underwear. Everyone, BBD, all of them. They, Fruit Loop, they all, they are, you know, Fruit of Loom, they all have to get their like rubber from me. Yeah. And then I start doing the calculation. It's like, Everyone has underwear. <laughs> Everyone needs the elastic around the under. This guy sells a product for, you know, 10 cents to like the entire planet. So yeah. no wonder he has this big house, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, that makes sense. Two weeks later, I'm at another guy's house. Same thing. I'm sitting there next to the guy. And I say like, uh, you know, what do you do for a living, you know? And he says, you, you know, the, the plastic that goes out on the end of a shoelace? He goes, I sell all of that you know, to the world. <laughs> and I'm like, really? And I look at him puzzled and he goes, do you ever lose that plastic on your shoelace and you have to tie your shoes or thread your shoes through your things? You got to lick it. You got to twist <laughs> it. You got to do it. No one wants to do that. They want that plastic thing around there. And I was like, yeah, they do. And so <laughs> what it dawned on me, I was all of 22 years old, right? What dawned on me is that the secret that a lot of people have to making a ton of money Get in the plastic is to actually, bin. Yeah, it's actually the most basic thing that everyone demands, right? Yeah. And so when we have this wide, so rather than like my son who makes music for, you know, 500 people in the world, yeah. <laughs> you make music that like Beyonce makes music, which is like millions of people want to listen to her music, right? And so this is a kind of an interesting lesson, I think, but we don't tend to, to understand that when it comes to finance. Like, why is it that the speculator is doing something? So they make these rewards. But, so I think we misidentify where our anger is directed. And mm -hmm. I wanna redirect that anger at the people who are being unfair in the game of distributing the benefits to certain people. Yeah, and no, I understand. Yeah. So, yeah. So anyway, I think that I, I understand there's a huge amount of and, and, and anthropomorphism when I'm looking at the Kapuchkin monkeys <laughs> and I'm inferring their emotional state from, you know, where they're shaking. But I, yeah. I, I think there's something valuable in us thinking about where our anger should be directed at. Yes, I agree to the extent that it doesn't stifle competition. 
Like yes. I'm a big proponent of the free market. And uh, if that company produces a good or service, um, they should be rewarded if it's helping yeah. the community and people want to pay for it and it's making jobs. It, yeah. It's bringing up society, but to a point where they want to be the only player in the game and be a monopoly, um, uh, that's where it becomes detrimental. Yeah, like, yeah. So you just saw this, but like we just like Jeff Bezos gave a very passionate defense the other day about you know his model. But you know people were complaining right about uh, Amazon, right? So mm -hmm. the various people on. But imagine what we would have just gone through if there was no Amazon. So we assume a costless alternative. Now, I, does, does Amazon have, of course, some protections from government? You know, look what just happened in Northern Virginia, right? We gave them like a ton of stuff for them to relocate here in Northern Virginia and have their headquarters here. And George Mason is part of that deal and everything. Like I teach at a, a state university that gets a lot of benefits from the state. And so I'm not I'm not trying to say that I'm innocent or that there's some kind of clear cut distinction, but it is the case that I do think that we sent, we tend to think that sometimes that wishing it so makes it so, and that's not fit with reality. And so what I worry about is like, so for example, is Facebook a platform monopoly or did we just forget that there used to be a thing called MySpace? And now, and now yes. Facebook is just happened to be the dominant one today. And that if the government doesn't just protect Facebook, that in probably another few years or whatever, there'll be an alternative framework that's up there. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we really want is competition. What we really want is, con well, I like the term contestation even better than competition, what which is that? is that, so there's constant contestation, meaning that someone is always there to contest me for the my my role that i'm playing so even in academia the fact that i put forward a theory it demands contestation from other theorists so that i constantly am checked against just coming up with right and science yeah. in some sense should hurt meaning that if i engage in a statement someone contests me and 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 beats me that yes. should hurt. I should feel like the pain of that. So it's like the pain of a loss. So yeah. again, it's kind of like too Jordan-esque or, or, <laughs> or, or Kobe type of thing. Um, you know, it, it's like, I actually think it's really important that Byron Russell has yeah. to stare down Michael yeah. Jordan holding his follow through at the end. <laughs> right kind of thing because yeah. that makes you know byron russell now more motivated to try to be a better so i think this contestation aspect as long as as markets are full of contestation then the bigness of a firm isn't the problem as long as it's constantly challenged but yeah. if a firm is big and it's never challenged then you get all the bad stuff exactly and, and part of the problem with the government in my mind, and again, I should be checked on this, but is that they play favorites with big firms. Mm -hmm. And what they do is in the name of protecting competition, they end up by protecting firms from competition. Yeah. And that's where it all goes bad. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, it's, it's a complicated thing because then if you look at the government, you have to have elected officials who aren't taking money from these big companies. And 